I'm Walt Thiessen, the crypto skeptic. Let's talk crypto. And this is becoming a very fun additional little segment here on the LOA Today podcast. So uh, those of you who are checking it out because of the cryptocurrency topic that we've been addressing the last few times, welcome. Glad to have you. Um, I also have a little bit of information to pass along. Um, this is actually the third, fourth episode. I think it's the third episode of uh, Crypto Skeptic that we've done. The first one was with a woman named Ann Casey. Uh, those who tuned into that one will remember that I promised I would check out her system. Joe, she's actually a currency trader, and she was uh, offering a system for people interested in that. So I tried out her system, and I can uh, tell you, I, I, I promised you I would get back to you with my, uh, my uh, results, so to speak, and my recommendation is do not do it. <laughs> Absolutely do not do it. I, gotcha. I didn't I didn't spend any money on it. It was all paper trading and trying things out and so forth. But um, all of the science that's behind it is a lot more like tea leaves and science. So there's my reading on that one. That but, makes um, sense. Yeah. But it, it actually did lead to something kind of interesting that I'm following up on. Um, and I, don't, I have no idea if you've ever – I've never looked at uh, Forex or any of the, uh, you know, the major trading platforms as, a, as something serious to pursue. Um, but I, I got kind of curious because of this experience. And I started doing a little searching around, and I found a couple of things that really caught my attention, including a platform for people who like doing chart trading and so forth, where you can actually do some pretty serious programming to kind of, you know – test things out like okay so here's a scenario play out the scenario and have the program do it and it goes bang 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 and all of a sudden you have your results so it's not like having to follow charts for a few months to find out what works you get bang you get instant results on it so i've been playing around with that and, and i don't have any results to report yet one way or another <laughs> but i'll tell you it looks promising so we shall see what happens that's awesome yeah yeah, yeah. the scripting stuff is amazing you can you can yeah. put scripts in there it's yeah and some of that stuff i don't i'm with you i don't really touch that's <laughs> oh. Well, I, I know that I don't want to get burned. And so right. I, you know, I make sure that I'm not burned. But by the same token, like I said, this is LOA today. We on the regular podcast, we talk about law of attraction. And this was a pure law of attraction thing. I was focusing on something related to it. And it took me over here. So I said, okay, follow it, see where it goes. Maybe see it goes nowhere. Knows. Who knows? Yeah. You won't know until you find out. But exactly. Finding out. Yeah. So anyway, my guest today is Joe Rotella, who is the host of the Crypto 101 show, which is a podcast, a very highly rated five, top 5% podcast on the subject of cryptocurrency. And when I reached out to him to uh, join me for this segment of LOA Today, this, the, crypto, the Crypto Skeptic segment, he instantly said yes. And the only thing we had to do was get the calendar right. And here we are. We got the calendar right. So Joe, first of all, thank you for saying yes. Because this is great, and we're going to have some fun today. Because yeah. I mean, you're okay, an advocate. So. I'm skeptical about the currency side. I, I, I mean, I love the other side of it, where they're figuring out ways to share data and all that kind of stuff. That's cool. I like that part. It's the currency side that I have my my doubts about. But this is going to be fun. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And and I am as much of a skeptic, I think, as you are. It's just a <laughs> different perspective, so to speak. But well, I'm then we'll find to out what this, and I think this will be a lot of fun. And I yeah. really, and I'm going to enjoy talking to you. So. I think it's going to be great. So, all right. Well, let, let's let's kind of do point counterpoint here for a moment here. Sure. So, we're we're going to let you do points. So, give us the the pro cryptocurrency argument the way you see it. Um, from my from my well, and this is the thing I have to preface it on my podcast. I don't really give my opinion on stuff. It's mostly just like this is what it is. Um, they're short burst segments, you know, ten minute at the most, and it's basically just this is what you need to know. Okay. Um, as far as with cryptocurrency, the, the, the thing I'm seeing out of this is, so we had, we had web one, which was read only. Mm -hmm. We had web two, which was read, write only. Mm -hmm. And we're heading into this web three, which right. is going to be read, write and own, meaning like you own your data. Right. So. Well, at least me, in theory. Right. Yeah, <laughs> I, you are exactly right about that. Like this is where they, I guess the powers that be, whoever that is, mm. um, wants to m migrate to this. So for me, there's an underlying, um, it's the blockchain for me that really provides a lot of uh, positivity to what's happening. Um, and cryptocurrency is a side of that standpoint where, where it can create um, somewhat, I'm not going to say totally, but, but somewhat of a financial independence or accountability for 
people's personal information or actual like uh, money currency account type of thing. Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm an old millennial. I'm going to be 41 next month. And my whole life was just based off of like the dollar using banks and stuff. And after getting into, I'm really, I, sh I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm more of a Bitcoin purist than anything. Like I don't really mess with altcoins, stable coins, um, any, anything like that, unless it has a use case to it that, okay. that's valued, like reading the white papers, trusting the programming behind it, that type of thing. And by so, use case, you mean other than as a currency, you mean yeah. various kinds of enterprises, storage formulas, all kinds of stuff. Like exactly. That. Like there's, there's some valid use case. I don't mean to go off on a tangent because you asked me a simple question. Yeah. Um, but like, NFTs are a perfect example of, of a foundation where it starts off as, well, they're stupid images and why would anybody want to invest in it? Totally valid. I totally agree with that. But there's an underlying thing that the NFT can do once it develops, if it develops into this. Um, and it would be useful to take down Ticketmaster, where we're now using NFTs to use as a ticket between, because I'm a musician and an artist. And for me, it's like, how do you eliminate these ticketing fees that are insanely uh, crazy? And this is, there's an actual company that's already doing this, hmm. but that's where I mean, like when I say the use cases, there's a positivity for it. If I say this, if it's used correctly, where we don't have um, corruption, you know, so to speak, or mm -hmm. like where, so there's a big, big if there. Um, but for me, the, the, the currency side with Bitcoin, there's a bigger picture where there's a lot of countries that their their currency is is crud like venezuela sure. all this stuff they don't have the ability to um get us american dollars or whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. so for them this type of currency helps them kind of get out of that situation where they're not in it anymore and and again there's no utopia i'm not like delusional like this is going to change you know <laughs> I do think there's some great things about it. It's just, it's so early to tell which, where it will go. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's, it's still developing. Um, but I see that as a positive thing because we need to evolve into something because what's happening technically in the economy right now is kind of showing that I, like this is getting insane with 80% of the, of the money that's printed from the, or in circulation today was, was put in the last two years like that's an astronomical amount of money and it's now starting to show that like inflation all this stuff is happening so for me it's one of those things where purely bitcoin even can be used as a good currency as a leeway to possibly changing this whole crypto market and making it evolve into something bigger and you know i, I don't know but that's kind of where i stand in terms of it all um so that's why i'm glad you had me on but I, like I'm sometimes just a skeptical of stuff. So <laughs> well, that's, that's fair. You know, that's good. That's why we have conversations like this. This yes. is fabulous. And, and you actually introduced a term that we have not talked about on the show yet. So I'm going to ask you to help define it. NFT, which I believe stands for non, uh, non-fungible token. Yeah, non -fungible. But, what exact, but what exactly is that? I mean, we got to explain so that people understand or at least can try to understand what that's all about. So the, the easiest way, like everybody kind of sits there and says, well, arts, like, well, we already can see the Mona Lisa. Why do I need it in a digital format? Mm -hmm. um, these non-fungible tokens, if, if you're looking at, like, I try to tell people, like, don't look at it from the images. Look at a bigger picture here. Um, but No pun intended. Right. <laughs> right. Um, these NFTs can be utilized with, with, they're encrypted, which means, like, the, which block, blockchain te technology is really awesome. And these NFTs are encrypted with this blockchain technology that allows people, it can't be duplicated or replicated only like, as in, let's say I'm selling my song. Each one of my like purchases for that is encrypted. So somebody can't take my song and duplicate it over and over and over again. Like we used to be able to do with, or you, you still kind of, if you have a D, like a CD writer, mm -hmm. you can't do that anymore when it comes to an NFT. Once mm -hmm. it's printed or like minted is what they call it. Once it's minted, that's it. Like that's encrypted on the blockchain. It's permanent. So that code is encrypted for whatever image, music, audio file, um, you know, a, a ticket for a, going to see a concert. 
So those NFTs, those non-fungible tokens are pretty critical when it comes to that because it's a different way to use currency digitally, but to still get goods and services in a digital format, so to speak. I, th I try to simplify it as best because yeah. there's like so much foundation you kind of need to understand to get the grasp of it before. Because if you tell somebody that, they're just going to be like, that sounds stupid. Well, but there's an underlying foundation for why we're going that direction. I think it's also helpful to distinguish a non-fungible token from a fungible token. Right. Uh, because really the difference there is one is actually a money type currency that you go buy and sell stuff with. And the other one is more like a final product. And once it's done, it's done. You don't really sell it again. You don't really transfer yeah, it again. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so the non-fungible token, that, that's the one you were talking about. You don't transfer it again. It's just it, once it's done, it's done. As opposed to a, a money, which is a fungible token, that's the kind that can just be used over and over again. Like paper money can just go out. You know, you can keep buying stuff and selling stuff and buying stuff and selling stuff. Correct. And you can, I mean, you technically can resell the fungible to the, the non-fungible token because as long as you have the encryption key that comes with it, mm. you can sell that again on the market. We actually, we just, I think there was, Somebody just tried to sell the first tweet from, um, the, oh, really? <laughs> and, oh my, and he bought it for like millions of dollars. I think it was like <laughs> 2.9 million and he couldn't even get like a thousand dollars for it. So oh, wow. that's the point where like you can resell these things after the fact, but you have to have that encryption key, which is what that blockchain like allows you to do. And blockchain to me is where it's just the bread and butter of it. Like that's, that's, that's a critical part of what we're trying to do in society with like data and like the tech side of things. So anyway, that, but the non-fungible part of it, you're, you're exactly right. It's a, in a digital realm, but yeah, but, yeah. Well, they're all in the digital realm, but it's the currency realm. It's, it's, the, it's yes. where it's, it's, a, it's money that you use to buy and sell. And then once you uh, sold something and you got that money, you could go buy something else yourself. It's, right. it's, a, it's a currency that actually circulates. Yes. Yeah, that's really the difference. Um, so good. Well, I like what you laid out there, and because it's a good uh, starting point for conversation, I, I think you're probably right. Just from what I'm hearing, we're probably going to find more to agree on. Yeah, than definitely. On. <laughs> I'll, I'll lay out some of the things I've been concerned about where um, cryptocurrency is concerned, particularly Bitcoin, uh, because I was actually aware of Bitcoin when it first came out, um, and. There's a piece of me that kicks myself because I I, I, <laughs> I didn't bother to mine the thing. I, I could have when it was cheap to mine, but I didn't. But oh well, you know, you live live and learn. No no big deal. But uh, the, the concerns that I had then are still concerns today, and I, I, I've listed a number of them in past episodes. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on a few here briefly. Uh, first and foremost, it was supposed to be a global currency by now that everybody was using. Fourteen years later, it's not which is not a good sign for a currency. <laughs> if you're going to be a currency, you're going to be a currency fairly quickly. I mean, it might be a delay in there, but 14 years, the, the thing I like to uh, equate it to is all the claims about climate change. Where our, our climate was supposed to have burned up by now over the last 50 years, over and over and over again. And I'm not saying there's nothing there, that there's nothing wrong with the climate. I'm not, don't get me wrong on that. I'm just saying that the propositions about how terrible everything was going to get have not come true. And mm -hmm. it's kind of similar here with Bitcoin. Bitcoin was supposed to, like you were talking about, save the world. I mean, you you didn't personally believe that, but that that was part of what the whole philosophy was. It, this is like going to save us from the fiat dollar and the terrible governments and the central banks with all the terrible things they're doing. And it hasn't even caught on on a big scale where it's actually an everyday uh, uh, currency. So to me, that's like the, the biggest one. And then the second biggest one is – the fact that there are now, I found this out from my last interview. I had no idea there are now 18,000 cryptocurrencies out there. I, I, the last number I yeah. heard was 11,000. So 18,000 like blew my mind. But there's well over a, a trillion and a half, I think, invested in it it's, right now. Yeah. And we know for a fact that all those cryptocurrencies are not ultimately going to be adopted by the marketplace. I mean, maybe one or two if we're lucky, you know, perhaps 10 if you're a real optimist, but not 18,000, which means there's going to be a whole bunch of people who lose their shirts. And, yeah. and I'm not against people losing their shirts. I, I mean, that's part of the marketplace. But my point is when you have millions of people losing their shirts about something that is generically called cryptocurrency, and most people don't know what that is, it's probably not the best marketing ploy to scare the populace out of their pants by hearing about all these people who lost their shirts in cryptocurrency if you want to give cryptocurrency and um, uh, address not just addressed but accepted and and adopted by the population at large so i i think that's like probably the biggest uh, obstacle that they have because i mean we both know currency is only currency if people believe in and accept that it's currency yep utility yeah. scarcity and you have to have a belief in it otherwise what's the point it. 
Yeah. So if, if you got to have a belief in it and you've got this gigantic mountain of a wall saying, no, don't believe in this, forget that. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's, that's a pretty serious uh, problem going on there. Um, some of the other things that bothers me a little bit, um, and this may actually surprise you a little bit, that one of the big arguments in favor of Bitcoin is that it's secure. And that the reason that it's secure is because transactions are being um, basically validated by large numbers of people. So it becomes uh, theoretically impossible for uh, false transactions to enter the system and, and people end up uh, having their money stolen and so forth. I, I worked in IT before I went, became self-employed in 2002. And um, the last job that I worked in was for a medium-sized insurance company. And my cubicle was about 10 steps away from the guy who was the head of internet security for the company. And we used to have conversations all the time. I, we, we didn't actually work in the same area. I was doing servers. He was doing ISO. So it was kind of a different thing. But we used to chat about all kinds of stuff. And I remember very distinctly, I don't remember the exact wording, but I remember very distinctly one conversation where he said to me, you know what the, the biggest risk in internet security is? I said, no, what? He says, it's when there's a software manufacturer who is absolutely convinced his software is impregnable. <laughs> <laughs> because that is the where all the guys who are trying to hack and crack this stuff are going to yep. go after. Because they just, they, they, all of a sudden they're lax. It's like, well, hey, we're safe. No big deal here. And, and I like to point out, it, they, they don't actually have to get a transaction in there permanently in the blockchain. All they got to do is get in there just long enough to extract asset, trade it for something else, and disappear. It doesn't have to be permanent. And when we add in the fact that it's a decentralized currency, well, that means there, there are benefits to that, certainly. But one of the disadvantages is there's no authority you can run to and say, hey, my burnt Bitcoin got stolen here. What do I do? You know, and by that time, they're gone. Yeah, so, there's no FDIC to, to yeah, regulate. Yeah, there's nothing or, like that. Yeah. I mean, you might be able to go to the cops, but they probably wouldn't understand what it was anyway. So what good would it do you? <laughs> yeah, and unless it's involving, like, unless it's involving, like, massive amounts of funding like we're talking like like drug which there there was chain analysis did a uh i think it was in 2021 they came out and in terms of cryptocurrency as a whole um because this is a number that always gets skewed too like everybody always sits there and says like there's so much fraud that happens with cryptocurrency and they get confused that like there's a difference between people being dumb and investing in dumb coins like a Dogecoin and getting mm -hmm. their money ripped off mm -hmm. versus like actually getting like money laundering type stuff happen. Like they, they sure there's a there's a disconnect. And I'm not saying that like stuff doesn't happen, but Chainalysis did an actual investigation on it and they came out with major like I think it was under 1% of cryptocurrency was used for fraud in terms of uh, like that type of thing, like money laundering, anything. And in terms of the black market, most criminals don't want to use it because it's too difficult for them to understand. So it still revolves around the dollar. And again, I'm not sitting here saying like, we need to give, it's, it's mm -hmm. not about that. It's more just like, I, especially with my audience, it's like, I don't care if people don't agree, don't, you know, it's not about disagreeing. It's like, what are the data and statistics and the facts behind it? Because then once we see that, we can get a better understanding of, okay, is it just a small percentage of the fraud? And is it just because some traders are dumb, like you said, and they don't know what they're kind of doing. So they put all this money into it and then they get ripped off because they don't read a white paper. And it's like, well, you know, like you said, it's decentralized. You need to like really pay attention to stuff. And if you're not going to, and you get ripped off, that is entirely, that's the accountability side. I, and I didn't mean to cut you off, but. No, I, um, well, you're, I, you're making my points, I feel like. I mean, I, I agree with you. <laughs> no, and that, but that's where I always try to tell people, because even in my family, there's there's people in my family and friends that, like, they think I drink a Kool-Aid, and it's like, it's not about that. I have a 10-year-old daughter. I personally believe that where we're going with all this stuff, their generation is going to be the ones that, like, are on the front end of this stuff. And for totally. me, it's like, I would rather know it now <laughs> than be like a decade or whatever behind and having to like catch up with what is happening here. Um, and, and I think that's for me where it's like tr teaching people to not, and I'm not, again, I'm not sitting here proclaiming I'm a great teacher, but like just to critically think like a bigger picture perspective of it to understand it. But anyway, um, I just, it frustrates me sometimes because people will take a small portion of things and they'll blanket statement over the whole perspective of it. And it's like, 
okay, well, let's take a step back and take mm-hmm. a look. But I, I do agree with you on, on, on a lot of your points where it's like, especially like altcoins, like the fact that there's 18,000 coins out there and half those use cases are like not good. Like, <laughs> not good. And, uh, very diplomatically said, I must well, say. <laughs> like, I, I just did, I just released a podcast episode today about the, the whole market meltdown with, with the cryptocurrency. And I only took a portion of it and it was about stable coins. And, and it was basically like, they're supposed to be pegged to a dollar, but that's not what happened. Mm-hmm. So again, it just is that same thing where I don't, I don't venture into that because I think it's absolutely ridiculous. Like if you're going to trade cryptocurrency um, and you're going to use it like a dollar, so to speak, why wouldn't you just use a, a dollar? <laughs> like, like logic, you know, and, and I get that they're, they're trying to avoid taxes. They're trying to, so they keep it in the crypto ecosystem hmm. so that they don't have to trade it out and put it back in a bank just to make it. And it's faster for them to trade. But at the same time, they're investing in, they're putting it into a stable coin that wouldn't even release where their reserve money was at to, to back up the stable coins. <laughs> it, and I'm not, I'm trying to get like, lower it down so people understand it but it's stuff like that that like i don't drink kool-aid it's more like what's the bigger picture here and i wish more people would do that because maybe we'd have better dialogue of understanding like okay this is how the function of it works and it's changing into this direction or whatever but anyway i'm rambling i'm sorry well that's all right but but of course you know i think what you're you're touching on here is actually useful information because really for the average person out there they don't not only do they have no interest in learning about all this stuff they don't have time to learn all this stuff they don't have to learn about the dollar in order to use the dollar they don't have to learn about they the don't. euro to use the dollar the euro they just go okay here's my money go you know it, it's that simple you know so anytime that we're talking about having to learn about something in order to adopt it to me that's just one more hurdle to overcome one more thing to make it more and more difficult uh for gr- what, what what should we call it widespread global acceptance yeah. to take place uh, and which is without that, none of them work without that as currencies. Now, uh, certainly there are the other sides, you know, the very, use, uh, very useful uh, forms of technology usage that can be applied to a wide range of things. And we're going to see really cool stuff coming out of that. But on the currency side, on uh, just treating uh, cryptocurrency yeah. as money, that I, this is why I don't think any of it's going to take place. I don't even think Bitcoin's going to make it. I, I think they're all going to end up failing in the long run as currencies. Now, um, one of my guests recently pointed out something that I thought had some validity to it. I can't say I like it a whole lot, but it has some validity <laughs> to it, which is he, he suggested that the cryptocurrencies that do make it are going to be issued by central banks. And you know what? There, 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 there's some possibility there. I could see that that coming up. I'm not sure it's a good idea, but I could see that, that happening. But I'm see, curious to know what you think about that. Well, that's where, and I'm not, that's where they mistake cryptocurrency. So there's a difference because all cryptocurrency is decentralized. So if a digi- if a digital coin comes out from a centralized bank, then it's not a, it's not a cryptocurrency. If they're saying. If so, they're okay, saying, we're going to define it as it has to be decentralized in order to be called a cryptocurrency. Right. Cause it's gotta be, it's gotta be decentralized to be a cryptocurrency. Cause a lot of the times, like a lot of people ask me about the federal, the federal government coming, well, they're coming out with their own crypto coin. It's like, it's not a crypto coin. It's a digital coin. And, and don't we already kind of have that? And the other perspective of that, like the Fed is so delayed. <laughs> like <they're, laughs> <Yeah. laughs> they don't even understand. Like when we talk like American politics and government, like they are so slow to come into the process of this stuff <laughs> that it's like, like that's another like five to 10 years away before they even get into the dialogue of having this conversation about it. But um, to, to talk back to your point, um, I, like China's already got, um, they already have a central central bank coin. Oh yeah. Um, but but it's a digi- it's it's a digital coin. It's not a crypto mm-hmm. coin. And and so many people confuse that. And and it, I don't get mad about it, but it's like well, we got to call it what it is because cryptocurrency is decentralized as like on blockchain technology. The, the those central banks, sure, they might be running blockchain, but it's not. They're the ledger still. They're the ones that are producing it. So there's always a central entity. So it's it, that's why it's not a crypto. It's not a it's it's not decentralized. 
I, um, I appreciate your point, but I really doubt very much that the public is going to discern the difference. And I think that the no, you're right about that. A, they're going to take advantage of it, and and ultimately, it's going crypto is going to become whatever kind of coin, whether it's decentralized or not. I think the decentralized elements kind of kind of fall by the wayside, kind of like what the word hacker did. I mean, the word hacker originally was about somebody who was learning how to take a, a computer apart so they could understand it, figure it out, try to understand how to make it better. You know, how, what could he do with it, and so forth. He, he was basically working for good. And then over time, it turned into somebody who was a malware distributor or a ransomware distributor or something like that. Completely different word. Not at all what the original hackers were all about, but that's what it means today. I think the same thing will happen with cryptocurrency. That's a, that's a valid point, though, um, with coming to like the difference between the two. I think it's just differentiating the point of when, when people think of crypto. It autom- and, and again, you're right. They probably could use a play on words. But the other side of that coin is there's a lot of people losing faith in establishment, especially in yes. America. And that's where I think it could potentially, like you said, do that. For me, it's like, I don't know, the younger generations and having people in my life that are part of the younger generation, they don't want all this. Like, they're tired of all that, like, user um, information being sent. Like, we sure. see it all the time with Apple. Apple gets hacked, like, with their le- app. Um, the cloud and stuff. So mm-hmm. I think, I think younger youth generations may adapt it quicker just because they, they're in a system now that's like, it's, it's archaic. Like we're still seeing stuff that's like, why is this still run this slow? Especially in government when it's like, holy cow, like we, we should be moving more towards something that moves a little faster than what we're doing <laughs> and, and can keep track of certain things better. But you might be right too. I don't like, that's the hard part. It's like, I agree with you. I think it is the hard part. I, I've actually been trying to figure this out for a few years now because I, I have a very strong sense that the way we think about money now, whether crypto or regular euro, dollar, whatever, is not going to be the way we think about money 10, 15 years from now. The thing I can't wrap my head around exactly is, well, how are we going to be thinking about it? Yeah, I know. I, I don't have a clear answer on that one yet. I have a feeling it's going to be something of a hybrid, but I don't. I can't give you a better piece of information than that. That's the weird thing about Web 3.0. It's like, it's like it's just slowly getting there, and we just don't know enough. To right. Like, and 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 it, it's kind of scary because we we see big tech, you know, how much they manipulate information and use information to do sh- shady stuff with. And now it's going to be interesting because it's like, where is this going to evolve with currency, with all of this stuff? This this technology is. It's going to get interesting for sure. Well, well, you I, you kind of touched on it really nicely a moment ago, and I, I don't remember what exact phrasing you used, but the gist of it was th- there is a an across the board losing of faith in institutions, and it's not just the big software companies either. It's losing faith in gov- faith in government. It's losing faith in religion. It's losing faith in virtually every major institution of any kind that has dominated, say, the last two hundred years of human life. Mm-hmm. They're all losing faith. Everybody, they're all they're, the faith in all of them is eroding, and people are just becoming more and more disillusioned by all of it. Now, how does that ultimately sort itself out? We could talk about that one for hours, I'm sure. But, <laughs> okay. but, but I'll, I'll I'll give you like one little insight. And th- now, this is coming from the LOA Today side, okay? Because I'm very much into uh, the law of attraction and all that kind of thing. I firmly believe in in two pieces of of LOA that I think applies here. The first is what we give our attention to, we get more of, and that's kind of what we're going through right now with this whole meltdown process because we have literally hundreds of millions, even billions of people giving a whole bunch of attention to all these things they don't like. They don't like the institutions. They don't like the money. They don't like the way the information is being used. They don't like, I mean, it's like you, there's a long, long list of all the things that they don't like. And, of course, by the theory I believe in, that means you're going to get more of it. So, And that's what we're experiencing kind of. We're getting this, you know, the bigger polarity. There's more and more uh, angst. There's more and more frustrations and so on and so forth. But eventually what happens is, um, and again, this is core to LOA theory, eventually after you have been so focused on all this stuff you don't like, you finally ask yourself the key question, what do I want instead? Mm-hmm. And we're kind of in the very early stages of people asking that question. Not in hundreds of millions yet. I would say it's perhaps in hundreds of thousands, but it's starting to get asked. And that's where the whole corner starts to get turned, in my view, to the point where we start emerging into this this brave new world, whatever that looks like, where we have a different way of thinking about 
institutions, a different way of thinking about data, a different way to think about money, a different way to think about all the things that have dominated our lives for so many years. And, and to me, that's the fascinating part. That's the fun part. Because as that happens, uh, this is, I, I honestly think that like perhaps, I don't know where you actually started. Let's call it the rest of the 2020s and, and into the 2030s. We're probably going to look back on that 30, 40, 50 years ago. Well, I don't know. You will. I may not be here. But uh, <laughs> but we're looking back at this period and saying, well, that was the, the period of creativity. Kind of like the 1920s was the roaring 20s. This yeah. would be the, the roaring creativity period. And we're, and we're going to be amazed at all the creativity that came out of this period and, and just how it just changed the world. But here we are living in it. And like if you lived in the in the roaring 20s, the roaring 20s weren't all that roaring for most people. No. It was, no roaring 20s were actually pretty miserable for most people. But when we look back on it, we say, whoa, a lot of cool stuff happened there. And we're going to see the same thing about this era, I think. Yeah, I, I kind of agree. I can agree with you on that one. It's kind of weird because we're we're really bystanders in the middle of it. And it's yeah. like this is just this is just getting crazy. And I, I, I kind of agree with most of what you said there because it's it's. It's going to be fascinating to watch this evolve um, and be a part of it, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and 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 I do think the you know, I do think there's a lot of people, especially younger, who are becoming more aware of you know. And this is just my opinion on the whole thing, but I think they're becoming more aware of like not wanting to be how society tells them to be. And this is kind yeah. of that. It's it's kind of a not a revolution, but it is, it's not a violent one. It's more of like a, no, I'm not going to do it, you know? And um, even the pandemic for me, it was like, I lost my job and I'm like, I don't want to go back to an office setting. Like I'm yeah. tired of it. Yeah. You know, I, I, like having a kid, all that stuff. It's just, it, I don't need to work 40 hours a week to be productive. Like I can be productive. Like you pay me to be on, on point and you're paying me for my expertise. Okay. Pay me per project and then we'll go forward with it. Right. Um, I think that's what a lot of people are doing. They're, they're creative yes. and they're realizing that like, and this is where I think though, for me, where Bitcoin becomes more of a rainer as in like, it's going to kind of become king in a way, not okay. maybe not tomorrow, but like, I think a lot more people want that freedom where they're not having to use a central point of authority to interchange their money or, or being it tracked or whatever it is, which let's be honest, you could still track stuff on blockchain. It's yes. even though it's encrypted, it's, and they, it's pseudo anonymous. Like if somebody gets your, your, your user, I don't want to call it like a username, but you kind of have to think of it like that. Your, your, your name is not like used there. So like, that's where I kind of get frustrated with people on the crypto side where it's like, Let's be honest about this. Like, well, th well, that was one of the original claims. I mean, that, I think that's yeah. where that comes from. It was one of the very, very original came, claims that when Bitcoin first came out, everything is anonymous. Your, 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 your privacy is protected. And as soon as I saw that, I knew it was wrong then and I knew it was wrong now. And, and at, at the time, I tried to explain it to people who I was talking to. I would say to them, yeah, I don't think you understand. Today, they, and I knew this back in 2008, today, they, any you know, with with the data that they've collected just so far, they can take any piece of information from you and get the rest of it. Yeah, they, they can take your email address and they can track the rest of it. And when I said it to people then, they didn't believe me. Now, of course, everybody believes it because they you know they've seen the evidence of it. But back then, nobody believed it. I mean, and, and as soon as you give like pe like people don't understand, it's like like if I trade Bitcoin with my friend, like mm -hmm. I have to give him my wallet key in yeah. terms of like to to, yeah. to pay me, right. you know. And and granted, like you can sit there and shimmy away on an exchange and like if you you could keep transferring it to a different address to try to throw people off but that's like that's where i'm like it, it some people don't get it it's like that's why fraud doesn't really happen as much as people think because and the coins and bitcoin's not even one of the big ones that fraud happens with i think it's i think it's um monero or whatever is it's like the biggest coin that has fraud and most people don't use it because it's not that good so it's it's always that same thing, but going back to like this wake up of, a, of I don't know, I, I hate calling it a revolution because I don't know if that's what it is, but like, <laughs> I think a lot of people are waking up and smelling the roses and realizing that like the system benefits from the youth changing stuff. And we're starting to see that firsthand with this creative, you know, and, and going back to NFTs and all this stuff, we can all sit here and make fun of it, but there's 
actual step stones to where this could be something beneficial for the creative community of some kind. And as a musician artist, like I said before, that's where I think people like to slough it off. And it's like, you really can't, you have to pay attention to it because there's obviously something there and, mm -hmm. and it might, it might be wrapped up in garbage, but underneath that is where there's a stepping stone to another thing. And, and it's hard to do like all of us like to get pinned into a corner and be like, no, this is how I want it to be. And I know, you know, and, <laughs> and I'm just as guilty. So, um, anyway, I do think you're right though. Like, this this is weird living through the 2020s and it seeing is. what's yeah. transpiring to be so it's weird it's also fascinating i'll, I'll tell you now again this also comes from having done my show my, my on the show on the regular podcast we, we have lots of guests that come through i have a series of co-hosts and almost every single episode is looking at life from a very positive viewpoint you do that often enough and you start to see a lot more positivity out in the culture so I think most people right now, if you were just to kind of take a poll of the population around the globe, you'd find a, a very negative mindset, you know, not a whole lot of confidence in what was going on, uh, a lot of uh, disillusionment with institutions, uh, disillusion with, you know, war in, in the Ukraine and racial issues and political issues. And I mean, it's just like a long, long list. But from where I'm sitting, I'm just seeing like little areas of improvement all over the place. It's like, it's like being in spring and you're seeing the first sprouts coming up through the brown soil. Yeah, it's not all green and lush yet, but you can just tell it's coming. And th and that's the way it seems to me. So, like I said, I, I have kind of a colored view because I have uh, this, this show that I do that uh, exposes me to all the, the most positive, beautiful thoughts <laughs> and things and you know feelings and so forth in life. But nevertheless, God, I just see it all over the place. <laughs> and I think it's wonderful. I think it's exciting to watch. I, I can, can't wait to see it just continue to grow. No, and, and, and it could, yeah, there, there's people all walks of life. I, I think that's like the same thing. Like people take a small percentage of certain things and they blow it up into this big perspective of some kind. And, and instead it's, you do, you have to digest it in smaller doses to like see like where there's that good side of things and stuff like that. It, it's hard to do though. I, I have not mastered it. So. <laughs> Well, let's be perfectly honest. We're all in the mastery stage. Yeah. We're, we're all learning how to be masters. I, I think we're actually all much more masters than we realize, to be honest. I really think we are. Could be. Um, I, just look at, I mean, it's, it's always hard to measure, but I mean, I can remember, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, pretty easily because I'm 65 now. And I can, it's just so easy to see a massive difference in just the way people think. Not anything else, just the way they think. Yeah. It's huge. And all in, one, in in my lifetime so far, and you know, hopefully my lifetime is going to go on for quite some more yeah. time. I'll see even more of it. But wow, I mean, I, I compare just my life alone to what it was like when I was five, ten, fifteen. Completely different. Completely different. Everything's different. Everything has shifted. It's not just the technology. It's the way people think, the way they, they behave, what, they, what, what their approach to life is, how do they think about the stuff that they're doing in their lives, how do they think about their work, how they think about their families. The whole thing has just shifted in a huge, huge way. So I think that, that also kind of fuels my, my viewpoint, like, whoa, there's cool stuff going on here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure you still you also see it. I mean, you describe yourself as, I love the term old millennial. That, that, that's not one I've heard before. That's kind of cool. But <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but, but but as an old millennial or an older millennial, I don't think you're really old, but as an older millennial, you, you are you were kind of on the leading edge of millennialism, whatever that meant. And yeah. and so I, I, I guess what that means to me is you saw and have seen all of the technical age come during yeah. your, your lifetime you know, from the, from your youngest age. You just saw kind of birth itself. Yeah, we didn't have computers. Like I remember the Commodore 64 was like the first computer and oh, we yeah. had, we had it. And I mean, my brother, my older brother knew how to use it. I didn't know how to use it. I was like, <laughs> I was like eight, nine, 10 maybe. Right. Um, and all I knew was like, you put hard floppy disks into it and that was it. You know, right, it was right. so weird because we didn't. And when we first, like we were the internet age of kids and I remember DSL modems, like, yeah, yeah. Breach sure. and all that stuff. And it's crazy. It is very, and I think that's why for me, it's like seeing crypto. It's, it's, the, and again, like going back to web one, just remembering how slow it moved and, mm. and all of it, like the old GeoCities websites and all, um, yeah, the, sure. Like all that stuff. And it's, 
it's gone. Now we're on these phones that can do everything. Mm -hmm. So it's evolving. And I think that's why for me, like with crypto, it's like, I'm not for nor against it. It's just trying to, trying to take a step back and being like, cause as I think that's the other thing, we all want to live in a utopia and our utopia. And mm -hmm. we're not realizing that like, there, there's no such thing and there never will be like, right. and there's a lot of crypto heads that try to like, think this is utopia. It's like, this isn't utopia. Like, like there's downfalls to it. Just like there's downfalls to every situation, but you can't tell that to people sometimes. Cause they don't, you know, especially when they're like so hardcore into it, it's, you know, yeah. Um, but I do think this evolves this whole web thing to a different realm, especially with the younger generation. And I've always said, my daughter is the greatest teacher I've ever had in my life because watching the world evolve mm -hmm. through her eyes again, yeah, like everything I thought I knew, I'm like, I don't know anything again. I'm with you. I'm with you a hundred percent. I've been saying the same thing for the last 40, 50 years. <laughs> we have more to learn from kids than from anybody else. Yes. Yes. They are more honest. They, yep. they, they, un they look at things in a different viewpoint. You know, it's, it's black or white. Sometimes it's crazy, but, any but anyway, yeah, I, Technology's going away where like, I don't know where it's going and, mm -hmm. but I don't want to be left behind in a way where then I'm trying to catch up or whatever. And I think that's why I started the show was like getting questions from people about crypto. And I dove in right when Bitcoin was at about $900. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I did not buy a lot of it. It was like, what is this thing? I'm just going to try it out. And I first thought I like I downloaded a virus, you know, I'm thinking all this stupid <laughs> stuff, but I kept it, you know, and, um, and it, it slowly grew and, um, it evolved into something. And, and it's funny that was in 2016. And, and now most of my, my good friends, um, all have some semblance of crypto or Bitcoin. Um, and a lot, of, but majority of my family and some of my friends don't. So it's one of those where it's like, I don't know. I, to me, it's like, I'd rather be holding it and just, I don't put, this is the other rule of thumb. I always tell on my show whenever I don't give financial advice. And, but I say, if you are going to do it, only put in what you are willing to lose yes. because you will lose. And like we saw with this market meltdown, it, just, and I, I hate saying this because I don't like calling people dumb, but there was a lot of dumb people who weren't paying attention and just lost life savings. And it's like, what are you doing? Like, that's a risk that you took on something you probably shouldn't have. So, well, it's the speculator mentality. That, yes. and, and this has been around for generations. This has been around since I think the first uh, documented evidence of it is 1634 with the tulip mania in Holland, yeah. where, where there was a massive increase in interest in tulips of all things. And there, I, I, I love the best part. The best part is the highest valued tulip was the one that was traded for nine hectares of land. <laughs> for a tulip. But that's similar, like, like that stupid first... NFT tweet from the, yeah, right. you know, it's the same. It's just it, that FOMO, that real FOMO is where a lot of people, and that's the hard part to control. Like I still mm. have people in my family that are like, well, I missed out on, it's like, you really didn't. It's just a matter of if you, if you, if you just, if you want to do it, you know, like you, you either do it or you don't, and it's not missing out. It's like, you just have to see if you want to do it or not, you know, but that FOMO is what people, and, and there's those there's the people that develop these 18,000 crypto coins that know that there's FOMO. So they're going to put some stupid name on a stupid coin that has no use case to it, except it has a dog face. That's not even a real coin. <laughs> uh, I hate explaining that to people because it's just like, because that's again, people think once you're in cryptocurrency that you drink all the Kool-Aid, it's like, no, it, I get that there can be cults with it, but it, I'm, I'm not like, it's more or less like, there's good stuff to it, just as there's bad stuff, but it's just weeding through that garbage that you have to get through. And that's where technology always goes, you know, again, like my girlfriend has a vacuum cleaner that, that, um, goes around. It's one of, I, I, I like forget the Roomba kind of thing. Yeah. And like, I know it collects our data, like it collects data and it sends it back and she mm -hmm. makes fun of me, which is okay. I, I appreciate her making fun of me, <laughs> but it's that same thing where it's like, 
it's always evolving. There's, there's things going with it that we just, we like are so far back. So it's for me is, can I keep up with where it's going and changing to? And I think mm-hmm. that's important for, for the youth at least to understand, like they're the ones now leading this charge, I think in a way. So there, there's a piece of this that we we're kind of dancing around, but we should touch on it, which is how um, buying and selling decisions are made. Because you're making the very eloquent argument for making your buying and selling decisions intelligently and, you know, using reason and logic and, you know, not overstretching and so forth. And there's a lot to be said for that. But by the same token, I also know from long years of painful experience <laughs> that every single buying decision ever made on the face of the planet is emotional. It's, it's rooted in emotion. Yes, and it, is. It, it, it actually came, um, came home in a big way recently when I investigated the thing I talked about at the top of the show. I was looking into this, uh, this currency traders, uh, gig and what it was fascinating because, uh, I, I signed up for the little trial period with her and she became my coach for, uh, it was supposed to be for a month. It actually lasted about two weeks. And before I said, no, I'm throwing in the towel on this thing. But, um, uh, from the moment that uh, we had our first meeting, she was saying the, the goal here is to trade without your emotions. I said, okay, that's a good goal. I like that one. And then she proceeded to show me a bunch of things that were all based on how you felt about something. You know, how you feel about what the indicator is showing you. Do you feel like it's it's pointing up high enough? You know, it's all feeling based. And I'm saying, well, wait a minute. You can't have it both ways here. On the, it's either going to be that you're going to do it without emotion or you're going to use emotion as your, as your signal. But when you try to to claim the right to make a, a morph of the, of the two, but you're supposed to separate them. Yeah, that, that's a great formula for victory right yep. there. Let me tell you that. And, and, and in fact, it shows up in the currency market because I've been experiencing, not experiencing, I've been um, investigating the currency market. And 75% of people who invest in the currency market lose money. You know, I mean, there's a warning indicator right there, right? Yet that's why you really do need to have a way to go in there unemotionally and so you can actually yeah. have a chance of, of surviving and thriving even. And there are people who thrive. There are people who make millions in the currency market, but they're in the minority because yes. they're among the few who are actually willing to take a very organized and uh, non-emotional approach to the whole thing. But you've yeah. got to be consistent about it. If you're not consistent, you're in trouble. Yeah, it, consistency is key. And I, mm-hmm. I totally agree with you. You can't say don't – like I agree with you. Like don't go in with emotion. Um Cause there was a lot of people that get attached to a Dogecoin or, you know, or, or, and, and they'll listen to Elon Musk, which I don't know why you would listen to Elon Musk. <laughs> but again, I, I have on my podcast, I don't criticize people, but like I, I sit there and look and like when, when someone's speculative of that, you have to be careful. And, and that's where people get stuck with their emotions. They like a person, mm. they say something. And all of a sudden it becomes like the word of gospel. And you're like, what are you doing? You're, you're doing it strictly because some person, and, and you're right when, when they tell you to do the, the, like, well, how do you feel about it? Well, you, that's, that's counter it. That, that doesn't, that something doesn't make sense. I and, and yet it's part of our experience. I mean, right. I like Elon Musk, not because of all the stuff he does, but because I like Tesla's and I like SpaceX. I, I think those are very cool ventures. It doesn't mean that I'm willing to buy into everything he has to say. Right. But, but I like those aspects of it. So, th- so there's where the balance comes in. You got emotional feeling like, ah, I like that part. But on the other hand, how far am I willing to go with that? Well, but that's because you're critically thinking. Like you're yes, not exactly. doing like, like you're seeing a bigger picture of it, which I think that's where a lot of, and I'm only speaking in terms of, I only, I've only ever been in America. I've never went to another country, but in terms of Americans that I know, at least it's always this. It's, it's never uh, the television. bigger, yeah. yeah. And, and it becomes, well, I like this person. And if they're bad, you know, um, and just as an example, like we can never, we can't ever just like what somebody does. And instead of, we have to like everything they do or we don't like them at all. Yeah. It's black and white, right? Yeah. And, and that's for me with crypto is the same thing. It's, mm-hmm. there's this grayscale. And that's why I like, I always try to say that to people is like, because I'm telling you, my family always is like, you drank the Kool-Aid. I'm like, I didn't drink the Kool-Aid, I swear. Like, cause, cause they'll, they'll ask. Tell, tell them you drank the filtered Kool-Aid. That'll yeah, feel the better. Filtered Kool-Aid. <laughs> but, but it, 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 you, it's, you're right. It's like without investing in, in stuff with emotion, you cannot have emotion when you're doing this. It's gotta be, you know, like, what do you see? Or, or once it's out, you have to realize it's gone. Like, yeah. that's how I view it is like, 
if I purchase Bitcoin, I'll go maybe like once, once a month, maybe once every two months when it's down. Once that money's gone, I think of it as gone. I'll transfer it to my hard wallet or my cold wallet, put it in my safe and it's gone. like, that's it. Um, there's people though who don't do that and they sit at a computer for, for eight hours, 10 hours trying to time these trades. And it's, it's so volatile that like, I like, why are you doing that to yourself? Like mm. that, that is just, and trying, I have a one friend who's, who's been, he, he's very smart. Um, and he does a lot of chart trading, but he doesn't get emotionally invested. So once he puts in a trade with crypto, he, he just, that's, doesn't get tied to it. He laughs about it if he loses money, which is how you have to be if you're going to do it as a trading thing. And that's why I don't trade it. It's like, it's just too, it's ridiculous. It's impossible. Like, and like you said, there's people that are successful with it, but they also start with a lot of money. They start with a lot of money to Most be able to do, do that. Yeah. It's like, so, it's like the old joke about how, how do you become uh, successful in the field of winemaking? You know, how do you, how do you make a small fortune in the field of winemaking? You start off with a large fortune. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so true though. That's, that's exactly, you know, that's kind of the, that's kind of how everything kind of works in, at least in American, you know, capitalism. It's like, you got to have capital to somewhat, you know, I mean, sure you can, like you said, there's a minute few people that do reach that peak, but then we all see that on social media yeah. and we think, oh, yeah. you know, I'm going to, ch- I'm going to learn, you know, and, and they, they get emotionally invested. And then when they put in all this money and then they lose it all, it's like, well, yeah, that don't get emotionally tied to it. Like you, you gotta just, once it's gone, it's gone. Like you can't, you know, I, I, I don't know. I discovered this one name that I didn't know before, uh, just by investigating the currency field over the last couple of weeks. Um, the guy's name is Larry Williams and he's pretty big, not just in the currency field, but in, in investing as a whole, apparently. Um, and he apparently took $10,000 and turned it into a million dollars in the course of one year, which is a really cool thing to do. Uh, but the asterisk that goes along with it is he's the only one who's ever done it. Yeah. <laughs> no one else has ever done it <laughs> before or since. <laughs> so it's cool, but you got to take it with a grain of salt. Like, are you ready to replicate it? Well, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then not to pick on him because I'm not picking on him, but then they sell a course and that's how they really make their money after the fact of, Hey, I made 10,000 with, you know, I made a million dollars with $10,000. Want to hear how I did it? And you get 10,000 people buying it. And that's fine to do. There's nothing wrong with it. But interestingly enough, he's not the one who would sell that course. It would be somebody else who would take his idea. Take his idea and try to sell it. But, but, but he, he, he probably had no interest in doing a course like that. He already made his million. Why did he have have to have a course like that? It was, you know, pointless for him. No, but that's, but you're totally right. And that's what I mean is like, it's this chasing of something. And it's like, like, that's the other problem is people, it's it, crypt, I'm speaking specifically for crypto people, but it seems like they chase something all mm. the time. And it drives yeah. me nuts. Cause it's like, what are you ch- like? You're chasing, you know, these gains and it's like, okay, well, good luck with that. But, but it's funny because I'll be on a few message boards and you'll just read stuff and you're like, I can't read this. Cause these people like, they don't see how they're like, they're how they're missing a point, you know, like they're, you know, one day they're up and the next day they're down. It's like so you basically break even or you're losing money. It's it. Anyway. It's the emotional roller coaster, and that's what it is. They're they're working on an emotion. The emotion that they're working on is, oh, this is going to be so exciting if I can make this thing work. And then it goes against them. Oh, it didn't work the way I wanted yeah. it to. I can't believe this. Well, I'm I just not. I must be doing it wrong. So I'm going to go at it another way. Oh, I did it again. Oh. And, and so they're just riding this roller coaster continuously. Yeah, I mean, it's a rough way to go, really. It is a rough way to go, and yeah. I, see, it's funny because as a crypto person, it's probably, you're probably like, I'm like, <laughs> just as skeptical as you and stuff. But it's, <laughs> it, it, it's mostly though, just like I do see a bigger picture with it, and I do think that the youth of the generation, the, the younger generations, the youth are really going to be utilizing this a lot more than we are are on the boat with, and I think mm-hmm. that's why for me it's important to stay afloat with this information for people like especially in my generation because we're in that middle of like we were before technology before like internet technology and now we're amongst where you're integrating in web3 ai artificial intelligence with Mm -hmm. you know this blockchain technology and uh, you know there's so much stuff coming in and learning technology but the the learning side of 
so it's all just coming in at one time and it's like yeah. this is going to get crazy either good or crazy scary depending on the route that this goes so. well i'll tell you what i'll bet you it's going to be both yeah and, and i think that the experience is going to be based on what you bring into it that's again loa theory once more but literally how how do you focus your attention what do you believe in you know how do you feel about yourself what role do you feel for yourself in in your local society by local i mean your your circle of friends circle of contacts your influences and so forth how is that all going to play out from your perspective and the answer is going to be a different answer for every single person out there yeah, some people are going to find like you know they're, they're going to be happy successful because that's where they tend to focus their attention on so there's gonna be a larger segment that's going to have exactly the opposite experience yes you know it's, it's the same technology <laughs> yes it's all Thanks. the same technology Thanks. this has been great hey before we go though to give people a little idea first of all how do they find the crypto one-on-one -on -one show how do they find out more about you how do they contact you how do they find out more of what you do Sure. Um, yeah. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm on um, all major streaming platforms. So Apple, Spotify, Amazon, um, and you could basically search the crypto one on one show and it'll populate up there. Um, I'm, I just released my 24th episode today. Um, and then um, th there's links to like contact me through my show notes and stuff. There's an email address in there. It's the crypto one on one show at gmail.com. Um, I also produce other shows and my main website is uh the wild one media.com um which uh if people want to reach out and get a hold of me that way they can um but yeah that's predominantly there, any streaming service they can find me on there for pandora so and, and correct me if i'm wrong I, when i was uh learning more about you for the purpose of bringing you onto the show here i found another show that also calls itself crypto 101 so how do we distinguish between are you familiar with that one yeah, that one, I don't know. I, I haven't looked too much into it, but I'm the Crypto 101 show. So the Crypto 101 yeah, is the key. the Crypto okay. 101 show. And yeah. um, I, I, I think I might be, I don't know if I'm ranked more than they are or not. I'm not even sure. I, I think I, they're actually ranked higher, but yeah, the, the, the point is we want to give them to your show because we already know you. You're the one, you're the good guy. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully if they listen to the show, they get good 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 things from it that's the point of it it's really not supposed to be opinion based like hmm. i really want it to be factual and i've had a lot of people hit me up for interviews and and it's been one of those where it's it's like i don't want to sell things on my show because that's not what it's about and mm -hmm. so it's hard people don't understand that that it's like the people that come to my show want to learn about it they don't want to be sold you know what new tech you know so anyway but people can find me through any of those streaming services and and I, it's the crypto one on one show and they can uh, find me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I'm on all those too. I'll make sure that we include a, a link to the show in the show notes too, awesome. so that people can find it easily that way. So if all else fails, look in the show notes, folks, it works. <laughs> <laughs> so Joe and Chella, Hey, this has been great guy. Thank you so much for taking the time and having this wonderful conversation. I mean, I love all the different uh, areas of commonality we found not expected, but I'm loving it. Really. Yeah. Loving yeah. It. I'm grateful to be on it. And if you ever want me back on, I will totally come back on to have a talk with you again. I will take you up on that. I promise awesome. you I will. Yeah. Cause this, this is the kind of, kind of, well, this actually fits in with the overall podcast. So this kind of conversation that we're doing right here is exactly the kind of thing we're doing. It was just in this case, we're doing it where cryptocurrency is concerned. Yeah. So you, you fit in beautifully. So yeah. Thank you again for taking the time. You really bet. Thank you very it. much, Walt. I appreciate it. And thank you to all of, uh, all the new listeners who might be checking us out because they saw it was cryptocurrency. Please uh, join us for regular episodes of LOA Today. You'll see links on how to follow and subscribe in the show notes. And for those of you who are regular listeners, we'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody.